morning, uh, we want to continue on the thought of uh, be the church, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit today and how we become the church. You know, uh, we started talking about this uh, last week together, and may I challenge you with this thought in the very onset this morning. Uh, First of all, uh, don't just go to church, be the church, amen? Amen. Uh, you say, well, does, is, that, is that biblical? Is that what we are supposed to do? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Do you see that? Ye are God's building. So what, what, what are you saying, uh, God? What, what does this passage have to speak to us about? It's, it says this very poignant, and, and we've forgotten it in our church today. Don't just go to church. Just, just don't show up. Be the church. I, I mean, when you leave, don't just check out. Be a part of the living, breathing, active, exciting Work of Jesus Christ in our society. Amen. Uh, I, I told a group of boys on Wednesday night, you know, we've got to learn how to, how to what? Fall in love. Not just with this book, but we've got to fall in love with the author of this book. And may it not just be on Sundays, but watch this. Every day of our life, may we, may we learn and may we grow and may we strive to be closer to Him, be the church. about protecting this house. Uh, This week we want to talk about and turn our attention to in the message, share this house. Uh, We've got to do more than protect it. We've got to share it because guess what? If we don't share it, we are not protecting it. We are one generation from the church of Jesus Christ being extinct. And if we are not people that are called and separated unto Him, if we are not people actively being the church, not only to our families, but for, to the people that are around us, guess what? Uh, we're not protecting at all. This morning we want to learn uh, one more step of how to be the church. We want to learn how to share the church. I invite you to turn with me in the Word of God to John chapter 1 and verse 50. And then also Mark John chapter 14 and verse 12. Jesus calling the disciples there in verse 35 through 50. But look at what he says in verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, look at this, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, Believest thou? That's a question, and I know without the context, that question can be confusing. Don't get hung up on the question. Get hung up on the response and the answer to the question that Jesus gives. Look at it there at the end of verse 50. Thou shalt see greater things than these. What what are you saying, Jesus says? What, you... You think you've seen something? What, you think what you've seen is is good and what you've seen is is real cool? You ain't seen nothing yet. Isn't that good? But then he doesn't stop right there. He repeats it again. And I, I think by repetition of the Word of God, he draws an importance to it. What is he saying? Be the church. And you think you've seen something, church? He says, if you can learn to be the church, you haven't seen anything yet. Look at what he says in John. Uh, John chapter 14. It's great stuff. In verse 12, look at what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And then he says these words again. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. 
Now, can I just stop for just a second and take a time out and preach to you for just a second? He said, if I go, he said, there will be greater things than these. He said, you think you've seen something out of me? This is Jesus. And guess what? We've seen him take blinded eyes and make them see. We've seen him take lame and allow them to get up and walk. Death, be able to hear. Watch this. Jesus done some amazing things. But he says, you ain't seen nothing yet. He said, in fact, you think this is great? Wait till you see what you will be able to do. Why? Because I go away. And if I go away, I will send a comforter. Guess what? He stood there with the twelve and he said, I am going to leave, but I am coming back. Guess what? Greater things are yet to come. Woo, somebody's going to have to hold my mule today. My back's even hurting. Not only do we protect this house in learning to become the church and being the church, but we share the house. And the Bible says if we will be responsible to this, Greater things are yet to come. We haven't seen anything yet. So what does it mean to be responsible? I'm hoping some of you are taking advantage of that note section on your bulletin. I think it's so important to take notes and come back to them. I'm going to give you some good stuff here this morning. And I'm going to try to be brief. (laughs) I thought that was funny. I don't know about you. No, really. (laughs) Be responsible. What does that mean? If I'm going to share this house, how do, be, how do I become responsible? We share the responsibility of our church. You see, we, we live in a society today that it's, it's so sideways on this. I mean, most people go to a church where, where they've got this, this big staff of pastors on payroll. And you and I both know that they are of the mindset that, oh, that's, that, that's the pastor's job. We are so sideways on being the church in sharing, right? In, in sharing of what? In sharing this house. Well, that's the pastor's job. That's the deacon's job. That's the Sunday school teacher's job. That's the youth leader. No, it's our job. As the people of God. And we've got to become responsible. Which means we share the responsibility of our church. I put this definition together. I I, I took all of the definitions for responsible. And I tried to piece them together for a good uh, church definition for that. Are you ready? Get this. Personally being answerable. Reliable. Dependable, man, I'm preaching real good to you right now. Reliable, dependable, or held accountable for what God is doing at my church. Isn't that, that's a good definition, isn't it? Uh, what, are you, what are you defining, pastor? Be responsible, share this house. So how do we do that? I want to give you three things this morning that I believe that we can do in the Word of God Uh, submits to us to do, to share in the responsibility of this house. Uh, Firstly, get this, uh, pray for its growth. And everybody sits there and they go, duh, I knew that one, Pastor. I mean, I really thought you were smarter than this. I thought you were really going to, you know, lay the ears back today. Okay, if you're so smart, if you knew it, why aren't you doing it? Woo! That'll preach. I mean, if you know to do good and you don't do it, what good are you? Woo! I love it. Praying for its growth. In fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2 says, We give thanks to God always for you all, 
making mention of you in our prayers. But you know, we're all sideways at this in the church. But we haven't seen anything yet. Wait till God's people really turn to Him in prayer and begin to pray for the church's growth. We haven't seen anything yet. You say, how are we sideways? Well, we've got these prayer killers. You know, I just preached a whole sermon series at the beginning of the year on this. Gong. I mean, we kill our prayers before we even get started. How do we, how, how do we kill our prayers when it comes to praying? Praying for the growth of our church. Here it goes. Are you ready? I'm going to give you four of them very quickly. Prayer killer number one. I don't want our church to get any bigger. Hmm. Amen. I'll say it. And guess what? If we have that small mindset that we don't want God's congregation, God's church to grow outside its limits, guess what? You've just handcuffed God. God's not honored by that. Prayer killer number two, are you ready? Well, I don't know anybody already. I mean, really? See here, we're supposed to pray for the church's growth, but yet we grumble instead of praying. I don't know anybody. Whose fault is it that you don't know anybody? Well, if the church would do this, maybe I would know more people. Are you kidding me? If you want to know people, you've got to get up out of your seat and you've got to walk across the other side of the church. And for some of you, I mean, some of you are killing it in here. Oh, Prayer killer number two, are you ready? I don't know anybody. It's not my fault that you don't know anybody. Hey, there is real estate right here. There's real estate back there. There's real estate here. There's real estate here. There's. You don't know anybody because you haven't moved from the seat that you've been in for how long? And here's the thing, I'm in a real awkward position right now because I know who sits in the same spot every Sunday. I mean, busted! It's right here in my notes, I didn't make this up. I don't want the church to get any bigger. I don't know anybody. Thirdly, I'm so cramped. It's so hot in there. It's so uncomfortable. Are you kidding me? I could sit on the floor and be just fine. No problem. At least you don't have to stand the whole service. Hey! That's what I'm going to do. Get me a chair and just sit up in here kidding me prayer killer number three I'm so cramped four can you handle it this one's hard I'm so unrecognized at church no one notices whether I'm there or not get this he is the alpha he is the omega He is the beginning. He is the last. There is nothing that escapes the eyes of God. He knows when you're here. He knows when you're here in the flesh. He knows when you're here in spirit. He knows that you've been to church. And the only reason everybody else, I mean, the only reason that you, you treat church like a tactical mission Slip in. 
slip out. I mean, there's some of you, I got to take the, I got to go through my office, head out the door, and cut you off in the parking lot if I want to say goodbye to you. You're welcome. We got to pray for its growth if we're going to share this house. We don't kill it before we even get started. Uh, Secondly, not only prayer killers, but let me talk about growth for just a second. Uh, You see, people see growth different ways. And I was reminded just this past week of another growth cycle that takes place that really I take for granted. You see, what people want to focus on is, is growth above ground. Let me explain that. A tree, when it is planted, where is it planted? In the ground, not above ground, right? And and what do people do? It's really not a tree until what happens? Until it grows, right? Until it shows something that you're able to see. Now, may I submit to you, it was a tree even when you planted it. You just didn't see the tree yet. Was the tree there? Absolutely. Where was it? It was in the seed. All right? But see, people look at growth and they want to judge growth by what they see. But that's not just, that's not the only growth going on, people. See, the question is, is, is you know, we can, we can grow to a thousand here. Lord, help us. But what good is it? If there is no depth of growth beneath the ground. I, I, I mean, if, it, if, it's, if it's all just fruit stuff, right? And, and, and we water the sermon down, and, and we don't make anybody squirm in their seat, and, and everybody gets this, you know, uh, compassion. Hey. I'm all about being compassionate and lovey-dovey, and I'm all about that. But if we are wrong, we are wrong. We've got to understand what right and wrong is. The growth can be viewed as what we see, but let me share with you, there's more to that. There's spiritual growth, and spiritual growth is beneath the ground. It's the root stuff. I was reminded of this process this past week. I've got a uh, a few years ago, Jill for Father's Day and the kids, they, uh, they got me a bonsai tree. And I, I keep it there in, in, in my office. And for the past year, and I, I am sorry to say for the past year, uh, it's not been doing well. I mean, it started with just one little branch and it started to turn brown. And, and now all of a sudden it, 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 it's spreading. And, and I had to get online. I don't know nothing about these things, you know. Uh, I've been watering it. I've been, I've been trying to provide health to the thing, but it's just not working out. And I got online and I did a little re- research, and here's what I found. Two things. First of all, you've got to put take the old soil out of the pot, put new soil in the pot. And you've got to do this about once a year. I had no idea. All right? Here's the other thing that I learned. You've got to trim back its roots. What? I mean, me, I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I grew up on a farm. I mean, uh, the bigger the roots are, the better it is, right? And I learned what happened is it, it's called root ball. And the roots outgrow the container. The roots want to grow beyond the container, and it's being limited or restricted by the walls. Whoa. Did you catch that? Did you, did you hear how good that was to the church? Uh, hey, we've got to spend some time on the roots and allow the roots to grow deep. But hey, we can't allow the walls of the building to limit the growth of the roots. We've got to be the church and go beyond the walls. Or what happens? We die. So 
So I trim back the roots, I put new soil in, and I'm praying for my little bonsai tree. That health will come again to it. Boy, what a message for the church right there, amen? Not only pray for its growth, but secondly, we've got to invite unchurched to attend. Now check what I just said. Invite unchurched to attend. Did you catch it? I I think maybe a couple of you might have missed it, so I'm going to help you real quick. Invite unchurched to attend. Uh, Luke chapter 14 and verse 23 says this. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out unto the highways and the hedges, look at this, mark this, and compel, underline that word, highlight that word, I'm coming back to it in just a second, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. We'll come back to that word compel, but first, unchurched to attend. You see, well, here's what happens. Church people like talking to church people. I mean, they, get, they get feeling a little uncomfortable when they have to talk to people that are unchurched. You see, unchurched don't speak the same language as you church folk. They don't understand the things that you know, the things that you do. And notice what this says. It says, we've got to speak to who? We've got to invite unchurched to attend. So what does that mean? Stop. Stop inviting your church people from other churches to come to your church. Now, If they have a problem, if they're not getting fed, if there's something spiritually wrong, I get that. But you and I both know that we get around our church folk. And all these church members and church people, they're trying to outdo each other with their church. And our church does this. Our church does this. Our church... When somebody's just going to be the church. Hey, hey. Then who are we supposed to invite if we can't invite church people? A couple months ago, actually it's been, yeah, it's been about a couple months ago. I I had a guy show up here. I was was here at the church and he showed up, knocked on the door. and He said, hey, we're thinking about checking out your church. I said, great. I said, where are you coming from? He said, well, we used to go to this church down here, and uh, we're leaving there. We're not going there anymore. And I said, well, I hate to hear that. I, um, I mean, yeah, we would love to have you. This is what we do, but uh, I, I, I'm more interested in why are you leaving there than what we do. What's going on there? And he started, you know, uh, 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 and I said, you know, I, I, you, you, need, you need to know this. Our church isn't perfect either. He kind of looked at me like I was funny. I mean, hey, I'm not here to sell the church. I'm not here to sell our church. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I, I, I think it might be very wise of you to go back to the leadership. And, and if you're struggling with something, talk to them about it. And see if you can work it out. They came to our church one time, which was great. I was happy to have them, but I still prayed for that family. And uh, just a week or so, I saw them. And I went up and I shook his hand. I said, how's things going? He goes, things are going great. I went and done what you told me to do. I went back and sat down with our leadership. And I'm there and I'm active. And, and we're going we're gonna to start this new group. And, and it's exactly what the church needs. It's exactly what I was looking for. Exactly the reason that I was leaving. I said, you know what? I'm so happy to hear that. It's not about stealing people from another. It's about reaching lost people that matter to Christ. We've got to be about inviting the unchurched. Look at what it says there in John chapter 1 and verse 35 through 50. Three things very quickly. I know I've got to go. First of all, 
You've got to tell them about church. They don't know what goes on in here. In fact, the, the, the image that they have is that we are weird. All right? They do. I mean, just, just think about it. They slept in this morning. They got up maybe with their family, went to the ball field early, or let's say they went to IHOP. I don't know. But they're like, where are you? you going to a building to do what? You go. And then you got that big guy. You're going to sing? I mean, really? You're going to sing? Right? Hey, you got to tell them. Tell them what? Tell them about your encounter. Tell them about your experience at church with the living Jesus. Not only tell them, but bring them. You know, what? A lot of, you know why a lot of unchurched people don't come to church? They haven't been asked yet. got a guy that I'm coaching with right now and Easter was coming and I know that they don't go to church and I know he didn't grow up in church and I stopped him on our way out of the ball field and I, I said you know what I said Easter's this Sunday I said I'm inviting you why don't you come to be with us at church he sent me a text a little bit later and he goes you'll never know how much I appreciate you in inviting me to church he didn't show up does that mean I give up no the seed's been planted, hasn't it? Hey, hey, can I ask you a question? Is the seed still a tree? Absolutely. Keep planting the seeds. Be the church. Not only bring them, but show them. Show them church. I mean, on Monday morning, drive the unchurched crazy on the way up 71 by you just uh, smiling and singing and they're horn cussing. They're looking over at you like, what is wrong with that guy? Just loving Jesus. I mean, drive them nuts. I know I've drove some of you nuts that way. You're welcome. Look at this. Invite unchurch to attend. Look at the words used in Luke. The word is compel. Do you see that? Told you we'd come back to it. Interesting word. Interesting choice of word because here's where else that word right there, compel, is used in Scripture. Jesus is carrying his cross from the courtyard to Golgotha. Remember? And the weight of the cross is dragging him to the point where he cannot carry it anymore. Do you remember? And in fact, he fell to his face by the weight of the cross that was upon his back. And the Bible says that they compelled one Simon of Serene to carry Jesus' cross. You didn't catch that. By a way of a soldier with a sword, they compelled Simon to carry the cross. Same word used right here in Luke 14, 23. Well, what's it say? I forget already. My goodness. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out unto the highways and hedges, look at this, and compel them to come in. That my house may be filled. I'm not saying go hold them at gunpoint or sword point to get here. But I am saying this. I'm saying that Luke saw the urgency. He saw the need to get them to church. And God thought it enough important to put it right there with that word. That you and I are supposed to go out and compel them. Do everything we can do to get them here. Not only pray for its growth, invite unchurched to attend. And then finally, are you ready? Make everyone feel welcome when they get here. Man, this is so important. Romans chapter 15 and verse 7 says, Wherefore receive ye one another, 
Look at this. As Christ also received us to the glory of God. The word receive is used several times right there in that passage. And it, it kind of jumped off at the pages as I began to study through this. So I highlighted that word, and, and that word that I highlight, I go and I, I look it up in the Greek and Hebrew to really uncover what does it really mean. That word receive, it's interesting. In the English it means this, to take into one's possession. Isn't that good? So, so here, how, how do we apply that right here? Let's look at it. Make everyone feel welcome. So you cross the threshold of that and you become ours. Did you see that? But is that real life? It's not, is it? But is it? We receive. We make everyone feel welcome. And here's what I uncovered. The word receive, are you ready for this? In the Greek, there are 19 descriptive words to describe our one English word for receive. Nineteen. Now you know why us English-speaking people aren't real bright sometimes. Amen? In the Greek, there are nineteen words that, that explain our one word, receive. And here's what your pastor got out of that. I'll get, it and get to it here in just a second. Four things. Are you ready? Four things that we must learn on how to make everyone feel welcome because Jesus did. Are you ready? Number one, Jesus started with acceptance. I got some of you looking at me sideways right now, and let me explain. Jesus started with acceptance. He accepted people. Of all walks of life, of all backgrounds, no matter what their struggle was, Jesus accepted them. Now don't miss this piece. See, we take the word accepted and we apply the word tolerance to that. That's not how it works. In fact, Jesus started with acceptance, but here it is. Are you ready? Take notes. He accepted the person, not the sin. There's a big difference. Jesus started with acceptance. So what is, that, what is that message to the church? Are you ready? We've got to learn to accept. Does that mean we get walked over? Does that mean that our, our values and that our, our Bible, that, does, that, does that mean it's null and void just because that person doesn't agree? No, you've missed it. We accept the person. Not the sin. Secondly, Jesus made room for everyone. Here's what's so cool about Jesus. Uh, remember the story of feeding the 5,000? Now that 5,000 was uh, men only, besides the women and the children, okay? Uh, so, so you take the 5,000 and I don't know, let's just say half of those guys were, were married, okay? And, and brought their spouses along. All of a sudden, we got a pretty good group, don't we? And here's what happened. Jesus said we got to feed them. Hungry, right, Chris? You wish I'd have brought you a donut today, don't you? <laughs> Jesus said feed them. What did the disciples do? We don't have anything to give them. And not enough money in the treasury to go buy something. Handcuff God, put limits on God, put God inside the walls of the church. Jesus said, no, we've got room for everybody. Everybody eats. He said, go gather your resources. They said, we, said, we found one boy. He's got a little sack lunch. He's, Jesus said, bring it to me. That's good enough. And he took that little sack lunch and he held his hands to the heaven and he blessed it and he fed everybody and still had leftovers. Church, stop limiting God. Wow. Jesus made room for everyone. 
And he gave up what he had for everybody. Boy, what a lesson to the church. Number three, are you ready? Make everyone feel welcome. Jesus didn't conform. He transformed. He did not enable people to sin. He lifted people out of their sin. Don't conform, church. Don't conform. Don't waver. Don't budge from what thus saith the Word of God. Can I share something with you? He means every word in it. Even on the front or on the column that says, Holy Bible. He means all of it. I don't think he wrote it just as a recommendation. Jesus did not conform. He transformed. And finally, are you ready? Jesus always found a way. Doesn't that just sound like a good leader? Well, we, we can't do that. We, we can't. Jesus always found a way. Jesus always made it through the red tape. I think that's why we see 19 different Greek words to try to explain away one receive. Look at what it says Wherefore receive ye one another. As Christ also received us to the glory of God. You know, I was broken. I was away from God. I'd spit in God's face. I had spit in God's church. I, I, but yet He loved me. Did He love you? In spite of your sin, He loved you. Inasmuch that He gave His life for you. And if He can receive us that way, church... We must receive others in the same manner. I'm talking about sharing the house. I'm talking about being the church, not just going to church. I'm talking about us praying for the growth of our church, inviting unchurched to attend, and watch this, making everyone feel welcome. Here's my last question. Are you ready? If you're lost and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior. Jesus is doing everything He can do to find a way to you. Will you let Him find you today? Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. No one's looking on.